Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. The 16th century was an era of unprecedented female power in Europe. Spain, Portugal, Hungary, France, England, and Scotland were all ruled by women, but that didn't mean that they were trusted or respected. The queens still had to face a seemingly endless stream of sexism from their subjects. They had to continually prove themselves worthy of the crown. To those that doubted her, Queen Elizabeth once declared, I know I have but the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too. But despite their best efforts, these queens were constantly undermined. Alliances and schemes among powerful men routinely threatened to topple a queen off her throne. And unfortunately, in the case of Mary, Queen of Scots, it worked. When Mary's husband, Lord Darnley, was murdered in a brutal explosion, she turned to her male advisors to help solve the crime. But she didn't know that these men were actually involved in a massive conspiracy to steal the crown and pin Lord Darnley's death on the Queen herself. This is Unsolved Murders True Crime Stories, a Spotify original from Parcast. I'm your host, Carter Roy. And I'm your host, Wendy McKenzie. Every Tuesday, we dive into the world of a real unsolved murder and try to solve the case. You can find episodes of Unsolved Murders and all other Spotify originals from ParCast for free on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is our final episode on the explosive murder of Lord Darnley. This week, we'll unpack the complicated story behind the crime and decide whether Mary, Queen of Scots, really had a hand in her husband's death. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. In the early hours of February 10th, 1567, A massive explosion shook the entire city of Edinburgh, Scotland. Mary, Queen of Scots, safe in her palace, was startled awake by a huge bang. The 24-year-old queen anxiously climbed out of bed, worried that the city was under attack. Was that cannon fire? Your Highness, it's good you're awake. Who could possibly sleep through that racket? What is happening? Are we safe? The palace is safe, yes, you're safe, but the sound was a large explosion. It came from, it came from the king's residence. How is he? Is he hurt? Well, answer me. Just before sunrise, the queen's subjects found the crumpled body of their 21-year-old king, Lord Darnley. He was lying nearly naked in a field a few yards from where his residence once stood, Now it was nothing but a smoking crater surrounded by jagged rocks and rubble. The logical explanation was that the king was thrown into the field and died on impact, but his body was in perfect condition. His body was not burnt, scraped, or covered in soot, which is not what you would expect from a body that had just been through an explosion. The exact cause of his death was a mystery, but one thing was very clear. The explosion was no accident. Lord Darnley had been murdered. When Mary heard about her husband's death, she was shaken. Her marriage to Lord Darnley may have been tumultuous, but she still cared for the young king, and she was overcome by grief. She was also paranoid. Mary was convinced that the explosion that killed Lord Darnley was meant for her, too. And if that one didn't get her... Another might be on its way soon. But in the midst of all this, Mary still knew she had to be a leader. She quickly summoned her trusted advisor and town sheriff, the Earl of Bothwell, and sent him to the site of the explosion. 
Bothwell and his men moved the king's body to a nearby building. They then began to search the ruins for clues, but there were none to be found. They performed an autopsy of the king's body, uncovering a broken rib and a few internal injuries. The doctors reluctantly concluded that Darnley must have been blasted away from the building and died from internal bleeding, but that didn't explain his lack of external wounds. The autopsy did nothing to help narrow down the list of potential suspects either. Lord Darnley's kingship was highly controversial, and there were plenty of powerful people who held grudges against him. Any one of them could have killed him. The king had recently betrayed several Protestant lords during their plot to kill one of the queen's advisors. And another Protestant noble, the Earl of Moray, was furious that Darnley had colluded with Roman Catholic countries to strengthen a Catholic hold on Scotland. Even the Earl of Bothwell had reason to be angry at Darnley. He was convinced that the king had besmirched Mary's honor by challenging her authority. The Earl had even gone so far as to sign a contract called the Craig Miller Bond, which swore to free Mary from Darnley however possible. Now, apparently, she was free. Regardless of her feelings about her deceased husband, Mary began a customary 40-day mourning period the day after his death. She sequestered herself in her room, dressed all in black, and she ordered her counsel to open an investigation into the murder. We are engaged in an inquiry, and we do not doubt that shortly we shall arrive at those who did it, for God would never permit such a mischief to remain unhidden. Once we uncover the truth, your majesty and all the world shall know that Scotland will not endure this shame. This wickedness will not lay hidden and unpunished. Unfortunately, this was easier said than done. With barely any evidence, the council had to rely on rumors and hearsay to conduct their investigation. At the Queen's orders, the council offered a large reward for anyone who could identify the King's murderer, but the money sat unclaimed. Over the next several days, Mary remained in her room. In her absence, the Earl of Bothwell was placed in charge. While Mary trusted Bothwell, many in the court were suspicious of his motives. The King's death certainly seemed to be working in Bothwell's favor. On February 15, 1567, Lord Darnley's body was laid to rest in the royal vault of the palace's chapel, but Mary was noticeably absent. During her isolation, the Queen's health had taken a bad turn. Some even whispered that she suffered a nervous breakdown. And so on February 16th, only six days after the King's murder, the Queen ended her mourning period. She traveled to the countryside to get fresh air and heal, but back home in Edinburgh, her critics argued that the travels proved Mary was not really grieving for Darnley. Late that night in Edinburgh, an anonymous citizen snuck up to the courthouse and nailed a letter to its door. It accused the Earl of Bothwell of the King's murder and said that the Queen had endorsed it. A few days later, a second posting alleged that Mary's servants had been the murderers. When the Queen heard about the rumors flying around Edinburgh, she headed back to the capital to try and stop them. The Queen returned on February 19th, but she was too late. The gossip surrounding her possible association with the murder had already spread through Scotland and across Europe. The theories on Darnley's murder varied greatly. Most of the Scots, outside of some Protestant dissenters, believe their queen was innocent. They all believe the Earl of Bothwell was to blame. In France and other Catholic countries, the rumors blame the Earl of Moray, a particularly ruthless Protestant lord. And in Protestant England, the gossip focused on both Mary and Bothwell. The speculation became so widespread in London that Queen Elizabeth began to worry for her fellow queen. Elizabeth did not believe the scandalous rumors. More importantly, she knew that if Mary's reputation were ruined, it would reflect poorly on all ruling queens, herself included. So on February 24th, Elizabeth wrote an unusually candid letter to Mary, 
begging her to put the rumors to rest. I must tell you what the world is thinking. Men say that, instead of seizing the king's murderers, you are looking through your fingers while they escape. I would not harbor such a thought for all the wealth of the world. For this very reason, I beg you to find the man responsible. Prove you are a noble princess and a loyal wife, as I know you to be. You may have wiser counsel than I, but remember, even Jesus had his Judas. Hoping to do what Elizabeth said, Mary reached out to the Earl of Moray, asking him to join her in Edinburgh. She hoped Moray could advise her on how to deal with Darnley's murder, but Moray refused. Moray claimed he couldn't help because his wife was sick. This was a lie. In reality, the Earl was too busy plotting with the Protestant lords on how best to take advantage of the chaos. Meanwhile, more and more letters were posted around Edinburgh. Each new round seemed to tie the Queen closer to the murder. The Earl of Bothwell's public rage didn't help matters. By my oath, if I find the villains posting these lies, I will wash my hands in their blood. The Queen could sense opinion shifting against her and Bothwell, but she couldn't stop it. The public letters were posted anonymously at night, and the louder she denied the accusations, the more people believed them. It's possible that the smear campaign was entirely manufactured by the Protestant lords who wanted to take down Bothwell, and perhaps Mary with him. If so, Mary played right into their hands. She placed her complete trust in Bothwell, despite the public suspicions. Meanwhile, Darnley's father, the Earl of Lennox, was growing impatient with the inquiry. He wrote to Mary asking her to arrest all the people named in the Edinburgh postings, including Bothwell and many of Mary's servants. Despite Mary's friendship with Bothwell, she agreed. So did Bothwell. With all the rumors swirling around the capital, Bothwell assumed the trial would prove his innocence. And once that happened, he might just be able to marry the queen and earn him a place beside her on the throne. Ultimately, the trial would forever tie Mary to Bothwell, leading all the way to civil war. Coming up, we'll explore the political aftermath of Darnley's death. Hi, it's Carter from ParCast, and I'm hosting the new limited series, Hollywood Scandals. We all know that Tinseltown is the land of glitz and glamour, but look closer past the allure of bright lights and red carpets. There, you'll find a more disturbing tale, one filled with tragedies and transgressions so damaging they've turned hopes and dreams into high-profile nightmares. Every Monday on this Spotify original, discover the real-life dramas of some of entertainment's biggest names. From the mysterious drowning of Natalie Wood and the murder trials of comedian Fatty Arbuckle to the star clients of Hollywood madam Heidi Fleiss. Each episode of Hollywood Scandals has been curated from shows across the ParCast network, covering over a century's worth of controversies, from the silent era into the digital age. Fame and fortune may be fleeting, but scandals, they stand the test of time. Follow the Spotify original from ParCast, Hollywood Scandals. Listen free only on Spotify. Wayne Simmons spent 27 years undercover for the CIA. When he retired from spy work, he got a big break. Terrorism analyst on Fox News. Then he met Kent Clisby. So I'm a real CIA guy. This is total nonsense. I'm Alex French, and I'm here to figure out who's telling the truth. Was Wayne Simmons a spy, or was he nothing but a con man? Imposters is a Spotify original from Parcast and premieres Monday, May 3rd. Follow and listen exclusively on Spotify. And now, back to the story. On April 12, 1567, the trial of the 33-year-old Earl of Bothwell began at a courthouse in Edinburgh. 
The 24-year-old Mary, Queen of Scots, was not present at the hearing. She was still in questionable health, so she kept out of the public eye. I have here an indictment for the Earl of Bothwell. He stands accused of the odious, treasonous, and abominable slaughter of the king on the 10th of February. The king's father, the Earl of Lennox, will bear witness against Bothwell. I will be appearing in Lennox's stead. He wishes to inform the court that he is only absent because he fears for his life. He also wishes to lodge a complaint. He did not have proper time to prepare for this trial. Noted. But the trial will go on without him. Do you have any evidence to submit? I have two written letters by Lennox to the Queen. And what else? That's it, sir. No witnesses? You really have nothing else? No, sir. Due to the complete lack of evidence on Lennox's part, the trial only lasted seven hours. Unsurprisingly, Bothwell was found not guilty, but many in Edinburgh still believed he was a murderer. Even some of the jury seemed to think so, even if they didn't have the proof. They said that if any evidence was found, the Earl should be retried. That didn't stop Bothwell from proclaiming victory. He sent a town crier to announce to all of Edinburgh that he had been found not guilty, and he posted letters across the city with a challenge. After having been declared innocent, I challenge any gentleman that still charges me with murder to a duel. If you dare meet me in combat, I will teach you the truth. Although the rumors around Bothwell persisted, no one dared to challenge him. It seemed like his grip over Edinburgh and the Queen was tightening, and he had a plan to make sure that that wouldn't change. On April 19th, Bothwell held a celebratory dinner for several nobles and religious leaders at Ainsley's Tavern in Edinburgh. I trust you are all well fed and drunk by now. Yes, my lord. Any more and I fear I would burst. Good, good. Now, I must admit to all in attendance, this meal is not just a celebration. I hope to secure your backing in an arrangement I am sure will strengthen Scotland. And what is that? I ask you to sign this bond as proof that you will side with me against my enemies and support my marriage to the Queen, if she will have me. Scotland needs a strong, native king to support our widowed Mary. Do I have your backing? Aye, sir. Most assuredly. The bond, signed by 28 Protestant and Catholic noblemen and clergy that night, officially cleared Bothwell of the king's death. The signatories also promised to support the Earl's attempt to marry the queen. Even some of Bothwell's adversaries signed the bond. It could be that those noblemen feared Bothwell. It also is possible that the Protestant lords were setting Bothwell up in order to take down the Queen. Regardless, the Earl of Bothwell wasted no time. The very next day, he visited Mary, Queen of Scots. Bothwell, my lord, I heard news of the trial. Congratulations are in order. Thank you, my Queen. I hope that you will help continue my celebration with your answer to this question. Will you marry me? A great number of lords have signed this bond, agreeing that our partnership would make Scotland stronger. I see. I do think our partnership works well, but a marriage would never work. You still have a wife, do you not? While Mary trusted Bothwell as an advisor, she didn't think he was a good match for her. After all, he was a Protestant and still in the midst of a divorce. She also knew that people suspected he killed the former king. Marrying Bothwell could be political suicide. Bothwell rarely took no for an answer. He continued to pressure the queen to change her mind. On April 21st, Mary left Edinburgh for Stirling to escape the chaos of the capital and reunite with her 10-month-old son, Prince James. The Queen spent two days there happy to see her son, but Mary knew that she couldn't stay away from Edinburgh for long. And so on April 23rd, Mary waved goodbye to Prince James. She had no idea that this would be the last time she would ever see the boy. 
On the next day, several miles outside of Edinburgh, the Queen and her entourage were halted on the road. Bothwell blocked their path into town, along with hundreds of armed men on horseback. I'm touched that you gathered so many people to welcome me home, Bothwell. My Majesty, Edinburgh is not safe for you. An insurrection has been mounted in your absence. Really? It's odd I didn't hear of that. Bothwell, let go of my reins. I am taking you to Dunbar, my grace. As the queen, I am not taken anywhere. I decide. It is for your own safety. The queen said to let go of her reins. Stop! Stop! I will go where the Earl wishes. I do not want bloodshed on my account. The queen calmly surrendered to Bothwell and was taken to the castle of Dunbar. Before she left, however, she whispered a message to one of her horsemen. Tell my citizens their queen has been taken captive. Hurry! Some of the queen's critics argued that the queen surrendered too easily and must have been working with Bothwell all along. But Mary was only traveling with 30 men, whereas Bothwell had over 800. She had no other choice. Although Bothwell pretended the Queen was his guest at Dunbar, the reality was she was his prisoner. The doors and the gates of the castle were locked, and Mary was not allowed visitors. She hoped to be rescued by her subjects, but no one came. Still, despite the hopeless situation, when Bothwell once again asked the Queen to marry him, she again refused. But Bothwell ignored Mary's rejection. Despite her desperate pleas for him to stop, he forced himself on the queen and raped her. Mary's sexual assault effectively forced her into marriage. Unfortunately, even though it had been against her will, the queen couldn't face the possibility of a pregnancy out of wedlock. She knew she had to marry Bothwell now. Back in Stirling, the Protestant lords gathered to discuss what to do about the queen's abduction. My lords, we have brought you here to join in a bond. We must liberate the queen from Lord Bothwell's tyranny. Yes, and protect the life of our prince. Furthermore, we must bring Darnley's killers to justice, particularly the cruel murderer Bothwell. Let's take down the killer together. Although they pretended to be loyal to the queen, the reality was that these Protestant lords were only looking out for themselves. They had a plan to crown Prince James King, and since the prince was still just a baby, they would actually be crowning themselves. But first, they had to deal with Bothwell. On May 3rd, Bothwell was officially divorced from his wife, clearing the way for a marriage to marry. Just a few days later, Bothwell asked the top Edinburgh minister, John Craig, to formally announce his upcoming wedding to the Queen. Craig denied the request, believing that Mary would not be entering the marriage out of her own free will. The minister was brought before Bothwell and his council to justify his actions. They expected Craig to ask for a pardon, but instead, he bravely condemned the marriage. To be clear, council, I have not come here to apologize. Bothwell has been charged with adultery and with the ravishing of our queen. He was not divorced four days before he wished his marriage to the Queen to be announced. Many suspect the Earl of killing the King. I do not know if that is so, but a marriage to the Queen would all but confirm those suspicions. These are baseless charges. All those gathered here know the truth, even if they don't speak it. You are all slaves to this man. Whether you are friends with him or fear him, you are allowing an abomination. Mr. Craig, step closer. Announce the marriage or be sent to the gallows. John Craig announced the marriage to his congregation a few days later, but he still railed against the union in his sermon. Many of Mary's friends and allies also tried to stop the marriage, but each one failed. It seemed that the queen had accepted her sad fate and believed she was making the right choice for Scotland. On May 15, 1567, Mary, Queen of Scots, and Lord Bothwell were wed in a Protestant ceremony. 
Most who attended said the nuptials were unusually solemn. Mary was a devout Catholic, and the fact that she was married in a Protestant church proved that she had little control over her life. In fact, as soon as the queen returned from the ceremony, she was seen crying. The marriage was the beginning of the end for Mary. Soon she would be forced off her throne for good. Up next, we'll dive into Mary's downfall and Lord Darnley's likely killers. And now, back to our story. The wedding of 24-year-old Mary, Queen of Scots, and 33-year-old Earl of Bothwell was an unhappy one from the beginning. Bothwell was a vicious, power-hungry man who had forced Mary into the marriage against her will. One day after the ceremony on May 16, 1567, a French ambassador visited Mary in Edinburgh, Scotland. (laughs) Majesty, is something the matter? Please, pardon me. If you see me sad, it is because I cannot rejoice and never will again. In truth, I do nothing but wish for death. This wasn't the only time Mary expressed suicidal thoughts. The Queen had been Bothwell's prisoner for over three weeks before their marriage, and it seemed like nothing had changed since. Bothwell did not allow Mary to see or speak with anyone. The Queen's depression directly contradicts the common rumor at the time that Mary had colluded with Bothwell in order to get married, but her former allies distanced themselves from her anyway. She was all alone. Meanwhile, the Protestant lords assembled an army of 3,000 men and prepared to march to Edinburgh to take down Bothwell. But they weren't doing it to save their queen, they just wanted the power for themselves. On June 7th, Mary and Bothwell fled Edinburgh to escape the lords. They traveled 12 miles south to a medieval fortress called Borthwick Castle. Three days later, 800 armed men on horseback surrounded the castle. Bothwell was able to escape at the back gate, and he abandoned Mary to fend for herself. The Protestant lords were unable to breach the castle's walls, and they eventually headed back to Edinburgh without the Queen. When they arrived on June 11th, they were treated like heroes. The Protestant lords told the adoring crowds that they had only assembled an army to avenge Lord Darnley's death and free the Queen from Bothwell. But of course, all they cared about was taking control of the throne. Back at Borthwick Castle, Mary attempted to rally troops to defend her, but she could only gather around 600 men who still sided with their Queen. Along with Bothwell's army, they only had a little over 2,000 men. The Protestant Lord's army was double that size. On June 15th, seven miles east of Edinburgh, the two armies finally faced each other. But instead of battle, representatives from both sides came together to try and negotiate. As the hours dragged on, the Queen's small army began to shrink even more. Some men headed back to their homes, others decided to change sides. Mary finally accepted her fate. She told the lords that she would join them if they let Bothwell go. But Bothwell wasn't ready for that yet. These are treacherous fellows. You can't trust them. If you do not do as they wish, they will imprison you and strip you of the crown. Then it seems I have no one left to trust. Come with me to Dunbar. We will raise another army. No, this is the way it has to be. So be it. But before I go, I have something to give you. Something that will prove these men are not as they claim. As Bothwell left, he handed Mary a copy of the Craig Miller Bond. The signed document was an agreement between the Protestant lords, the Queen's advisers, and Bothwell himself to get rid of Darnley by any means possible. Mary was stunned to see that everyone close to her had lied to her for months. This was clearly the sign of a conspiracy against her. Nevertheless, the Queen left with the lords as she had promised. 
and their warm welcome quickly turned cold. Welcome, my majesty. You are finally among your true and faithful subjects. I hope that proves so, Lord Morton. Burn the murderess! Adulterer! King killer! Quiet, men! Quiet! Why do they call me a murderer, Lord Morton, when I've been told you and your friends are in fact the guilty ones? Mary hoped that the lords would treat her with respect. Instead, they berated her and kept her under guard as they marched into Edinburgh. I will have your heads for this! By the time she reached Edinburgh, the queen was a dirty, tearful mess. The citizens of her hometown did not treat her any better than the soldiers had. Drown her! Kill her! As Mary rode through town, it became clear that she no longer had the respect necessary to reign as queen. She had already lost the throne. And when the lords learned that Mary had seen the Craig Miller bond, they realized they needed to find a way to shut the queen up for good. They couldn't put Mary on trial, so they just imprisoned her indefinitely. The queen was held in Loch Leven Castle, a fortress on an island in the middle of a large lake. The owner of the castle was a relative of the Earl of Moray, and he made sure Mary did not escape. Meanwhile, in Edinburgh, the Protestant lords put on a big show of investigating the king's murder. They questioned dozens of servants and minor players in Darnley's death, but they made sure the evidence pointed towards Bothwell. Two of Bothwell's men were executed on June 27th. The lords claimed they now had enough proof to decisively say that he was the king's murderer. Hiding out in the north of Scotland, the Earl of Bothwell knew he was a wanted man. He tried to escape to France, but the lords managed to capture him in Denmark. With Bothwell out of the way, the lords turned their attention to the queen. Why have you treasonous men come to visit your queen? We have here a document for you to sign. An abdication of the throne and an appointment of the Earl of Moray to serve as regent until Prince James comes of age. I would never sign such a document. It would be in your best interest. You must put my case in front of Parliament. My voice must be heard on this matter. If you don't sign this, your voice will never be heard again. I will cut your throat. Fine. I'll sign. But a document signed by me under duress is not binding. And with that, the Protestant lords got what they wanted. On July 29th, the one-year-old Prince James was crowned King of Scotland. The Earl of Moray was proclaimed regent one month later, which meant Moray would rule Scotland until James came of age. Scotland now had a Protestant government for the first time in its history. The Protestant government continued their supposed investigation into Darnley's death. On December 4th, the Lords formally charged the Queen with the King's murder. But Mary's tragic story was far from over. In 1568, she escaped Loch Leven Castle and fled south to England. She hoped that her cousin, Queen Elizabeth, would help her reclaim the Scottish throne. Her dreams were quickly dashed. Instead of a warm welcome, Elizabeth, fearing for her own throne, imprisoned Mary for almost two decades. Finally, in 1586, the 43-year-old Mary was caught plotting with English Catholics to overthrow Queen Elizabeth. One year later, she was executed, but not before uttering her famous last words. In my end is my beginning. Looking at all of the evidence of the many people involved, I think Lord Bothwell was actually the mastermind behind the King's murder. He had the motivation, the access, and the ruthlessness. I partially agree. Bothwell was almost certainly involved, but the Earl of Moray and the other Protestant lords were the real brains behind the plan. 
After all, they ultimately gain the most from Darnley's death. Whatever the truth may be, Lord Darnley's murder brought political chaos to Scotland and changed the face of that country forever. And although she was remembered for centuries as a murderer, her real story is much sadder and more complex. Now, it seems like the legacy of Mary, Queen of Scots, is beginning to get its due. Thanks again for tuning in to Unsolved Murders. We'll be back next week with a new episode. You can find all episodes of Unsolved Murders and all other Spotify originals from Parcast for free on Spotify. We'll see you next time. If we live till next time. Unsolved Murders True Crime Stories is a Spotify original from Parcast. Executive producers include Max and Ron Cutler. Sound design by Michael Langsner, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro, Carly Madden, and Isabella Way. This episode of Unsolved Murders is written by Matt Hartman, with writing assistance by River Donahay and Giles Hofseth. Fact-checking by Cara Mackerlean and research by Mickey Taylor. The amazing cast of voice actors includes Tom Bauer, Eddie Lee, Laura Faye Smith, Dan Velasquez, and Jen Wong. Unsolved Murder stars Wendy McKenzie and Carter Roy. Hey there, Carter again. Before you go, remember to check out my new podcast limited series, Hollywood Scandals. In anticipation of the Oscars, we're unearthing some of the most sordid controversies in showbiz history. Tune in every Monday. Follow Hollywood Scandals free only on Spotify. <laughs>